It's been called the last great adventure of the 19th century. In 1896, prospectors in Yukon Territory fished a thumb-sized nugget of gold out of Rabbit Creek. The find triggered a human tsunami not seen since the days of the California Gold Rush. Across the US, tens of thousands abandoned their homes to take their chances in the northern wilderness. At a time when a city like Seattle might have had a population of only 40,000, 100,000 people converged on Klondike, hoping to strike it rich. Instead, what many of them found was death, disease, and destitution. But there's more to the story of the Klondike Gold Rush than merely another tale of human greed and tragedy. Across Yukon and Alaska, towns and trails still remain as living markers of that heady time. Places where tens of thousands experienced hope and desperation in equal measure, searching for gold in the far-flung hills. In today's video, we take you through these places and embark on a journey into history's last great gold rush. It was a humid August day when Tagish First Nations prospector Skookum Jim and his American partner George Carmack first pulled gold from Rabbit Creek. The year was 1896. That summer, Jim and Carmack had been slowly making their way along the Yukon River with their friends Dawson Charlie, looking for ways to make cash. A month or two earlier, Carmack had decided God wanted him to take up salmon fishing, and the three had spent the last few weeks trying to land a decent catch. It wasn't until July that Carmack bumped into a prospector called Robert Henderson and had the conversation that would change all of their lives. Henderson was bragging that he'd just staked out a claim for gold. Where? Carmack had asked. Near Klondike River, came the reply. So Skookum Jim, George Carmack, and Dawson Charlie had all drifted upstream, unsure if the prospector was yanking their chain, but sure that they had nothing better to do. And now here they were, out in the remotest reaches of the Yukon wilderness, looking at a lump of gold big enough to change their lives. Not that it would be just Jim, Carmack, and Charlie who had their lives changed that August day, though. At the time the trio made their finds, there had been rumors of gold in Klondike for decades. Back in 1878, a man called George Holt had returned from the wilderness with a handful of nuggets. Eight years later, gold had been found at Forty Mile River, a tributary of the Yukon. By the time 1896 rolled around, there were a couple of hundred dedicated panhandlers in the area, all looking to strike it big. There were even people ready to start selling future prospectors shovels. And you know that phrase, if you want to get rich during a gold rush, sell shovels? Well, a steamboat captain named William Moore had already founded Skagway in the Alaska Panhandle specifically for selling shovels during the gold rush that he thought was coming. But not even William Moore could have predicted how big that rush would be. Back at Rabbit Creek, George Carmack left Skookum Jim and Dawson Charlie and hiked down to the town at Forty Mile River to stake his claim. On the way, he showed everybody he passed a shotgun cartridge filled with gold and bragged about how much money he was going to make. You can probably guess how everyone reacted to that. By September, Rabbit Creek, now renamed Bonanza Creek, was swarming with prospectors. Then someone found an even bigger load at nearby El Dorado Creek, and the Yukon went bananas. Before the month was out, pretty much everyone in Yukon was camped out at the points where the Yukon and Klondike Rivers met, the future site of Dawson City. But everyone in Yukon terms is equivalent to really not that many people in most of the rest of the world. The few hundred people at the future site of Dawson City couldn't exactly qualify as a gold rush. It would take until the following summer for things to really take off. All through that winter, the harsh weather left Yukon completely cut off. As the lucky prospectors staked their claims, the rest of the world was utterly unaware of the find. That all changed in July of 1897. That month, the first steamer docked in Seattle, carrying half a ton of Yukon gold. It was followed by another and another. Before long, the citizens of Seattle were staring open-mouthed at two tons of gold. Klondike's secret was out. There was now no stopping the tide of humanity that would come crashing into Canada. William Moore's predicted gold rush. It had fully arrived. Skagway's founder couldn't have known that it was destined to sweep him away.
In many ways, the residents of Seattle and the Pacific Northwest were perfectly primed for gold fever. The greatest rush of all time, the California Gold Rush of 1849, was still within living memory. Indeed, many of the prospectors already in Yukon, including George Carmack, were children of the so-called 49ers. More importantly, though, gold fever hit because people desperately needed some good news. For the last four years, the U.S. had been caught in the midst of one of the worst depressions on record. The economy was a wreck, populism was exploding, and life was harsh. Add to that the late 19th century's lack of social safety net, and you have a world where many were drowning in misery. So when two tons of gold came sailing over the horizon, it was like a bunch of magical leprechauns had docked, promising everyone free wishes. The effects of this were as dramatic as they were predictable. In Seattle, a quarter of the police force quit on the spot to head north and dig for gold. The mayor walked out of City Hall, bought a pickaxe, and set off to find his fortune. In a single week, 3,000 people left the city, including drivers who abandoned their streetcars in the road. The fever got so great that even the famous were dragged in. Wyatt Earp, yes, that Wyatt Earp, was among those who headed for Yukon, while inventor extraordinaire Nikola Tesla announced he would design a portable X-ray machine to scan for gold. As word spread across America, tens of thousands all dropped whatever they were doing and made haste for the North, all following the spirit of 49. They would have done better to follow its lessons. By one estimate, 20% of all of those who descended on California back in 1849 had died, so unfit were they for mining gold. Now in 1897, the world it was just facing a repeat. Of the 100,000 people who would eventually travel to Klondike, almost none had any experience in mining, of surviving in the wilds, or of the Canadian winter. Almost immediately, the first deaths occurred as people too impatient to wait for the next steamer to Yukon set out in whatever boats they could buy. The guys selling those boats weren't always too careful to check their crafts were seaworthy. At this stage of the rush, though, these deaths were just ominous rumblings. By the end of the month, the first ship carrying prospectors had reached the Alaskan Panhandle. For the next two years, Yukon would be the epicenter of more desperation and human drama than the region had ever seen. It's impossible to know what went through William Moore's mind as he saw the first steamer appear on the horizon. The founder of Skagway, population William Moore, had been waiting for this moment ever since he accurately predicted the Yukon would be the site of a future gold rush. But if the Alaskan Oracle thought he was going to make his fortune off the incoming boat, he was about to get a nasty shock. The steamer was Cortez and the Conquistadors approaching Mexico, and William Moore's dream was about to go the way of the Aztec Empire. As first hundreds, then thousands landed, William Moore's property became an ugly, squalid township where hope went to die. Tents were pitched in close, crowded quarters with little thought given to sanitation. Crude buildings sprang up with no central plan and no one ensuring they were habitable. It was like if the Calais jungle somehow mated with fire festivals who produce a miserable, rain-drenched tent city of a love child. There were fights, murders, disease. Humans moved through Skagway's cramped streets, not in orderly fashion, but in a shoving, screaming, mud-coated mass of filth and desperation. Not for nothing did one officer of the Northwest Mounted Police call the town Hell on Earth. Still, while most prospectors stopped in Skagway only long enough to get their bearings before embarking on the 600-mile journey to Klondike, a few managed to find their niche there. One was Soapy Smith, a notorious American con man who'd committed murder in Denver and had briefly raised a militia for the Mexican dictator Porfirio Diaz. He was then chased out of Mexico for trying to con Diaz himself. In Skagway, Soapy was able to reinvent himself as a lawman in the mold of Wyatt Earp. At least, that was how Soapy portrayed it. In reality, his lawman act was a front to disguise his own racketeering and fraud operations. But there were more legitimate ways to thrive in Skagway, too. From the town, it was a 40-mile trek to Bennett Lake, where you could sail a boat along the Yukon to Klondike. One enterprising young man arrived in Skagway, not with a shovel and tents, but a team of mules. He hired these out to prospectors for carrying their equipment to the lake and was soon making $5,000 a day. Forget selling shovels, apparently during a gold rush what you want to do is be the guy with all the spare donkeys lying around. But still, Skagway was just a start for most of the people involved in today's tale. 
A jumping off point similar to Dyer a little further along the river. They got in, stamped on William Moore's dreams, threw some money at some overpriced mules, and got out again. Had they known what awaited them, it seems likely many of them would have stayed. If you've ever seen The Gold Rush by Charlie Chaplin, you probably remember the iconic shot of hundreds of shivering men tramping up a near-vertical incline of ice. Well, that really happened. Once you left Skagway, you had two choices for getting to Bennett Lake. One of them involved scrambling over four miles of sheer ice. So steep was Chilkoot Pass that anyone attempting it had to drag up their equipment piece by piece, climbing once and leaving their stuff at the top, then going all the way back down and picking up the next batch. The Northwest Mounted Police had decreed any prospectors entering Canada had to carry a thousand pounds of supplies, enough to last a year. For those unable to afford Skagway's outrageous mule rental prices, that meant the best part of a week just getting all their equipment up the Chalkoot Pass. And that was only if they survived. Thanks to the awful weather and the inexperience of most climbing it, Chalkoot Pass saw a huge proportion of the deaths that occurred during the rush. There were deaths by hypothermia, deaths caused by people slipping and falling. In April 1898, there were three avalanches in just 24 hours, killing a total of 70 people. Still, Chilkoot Pass was just one way of getting to Bennett Lake. If you didn't want to be swept away by a snowslide, you could always take the route over White Pass, or to give it its more accurate nickname, Dead Horse Trail. Sections of White Pass involved a path a mere two feet wide, with a sheer cliff on one side and a 500-foot drop on the other. So many horses fell down that drop, it got the name Dead Horse Gulch. You can still see their bones there to this very day. Whether you went by Snowy Mountain Dead Slide Pass or Kill All the Horses Trail, though, you were always destined to end up at Bennett Lake. Remember how we said that you could sail a boat from Bennett Lake to Klondike and Fortune? Well, what we neglected to mention is that you had to build that boat first yourself using trees that you yourself cut down. A very, very tiny number of the prospectors who landed at Skagway managed to do this before the winter of 1897 set in. The rest, and we're talking tens of thousands of people, all got stuck on the shores as the water turned to ice. The result was one of the most depressing campsites ever created. Most of the mostly male prospectors were living off something called the three Bs – bacon, beans, and bread. So not only did frostbite and loneliness do many of them in, scurvy and malnutrition were not far behind. Finally, in May of 1898, the ice broke. Almost immediately, a flotilla of homemade boats was steaming down the Yukon, headed for Klondike. Nearly two years after Skookum Jim and George Carmack first found gold, the gold rush had finally arrived. One of the few people to have any good memories of the Klondike gold rush was the writer Jack London. That's because London was a qualified, experienced sailor. And after all those homemade boats started capsizing and killing scores on the Yukon River, the Northwest Mounted Police decreed that only boats with qualified captains would be able to set out from Bennett Lake. So Jack London gave up on his gold dreams and became a captain for hire, a move which made him more money than prospecting ever could. But the majority of prospectors, they didn't have that option. Instead, they were forced to spend what little money they had left to ensure they could get to the gold fields upriver. And that's only if they had the money at all. Of the 100,000 people who descended on Skagway and Dare after gold fever broke out, only 40,000 would make it back to Dawson City and Klondike. The rest either died, stayed in Skagway, or spent a miserable winter camped out on Bennett Lake, only to discover that they now had to pack up their equipment and turn back. You'll find this is a recurrent feature of all the stories surrounding the Klondike gold rush, the cruel shattering of people's dreams. Even the bad guys don't come out of this tale particularly well. The same summer that tens of thousands were turning back from Lake Bennett, cursing their luck, Soapy Smith was shot dead in Skagway, the town had stolen from William Moore. Perhaps the best advice would really be, during a gold rush, just stay the heck away. But the biggest disappointment was reserved for the guys who could afford to get Jack London to captain their ship along the river. Waiting at the ends for them was Dawson City, by now a boom town with a thriving population and a reputation for law and order. Skagway this was not. There were concert halls and even hotels with electric lighting, all built in a couple of years since September of 1896. So why did Dawson City seem like a horrible punchline to so many of the prospectors? Well, that's simple. 
Out in the Klondike goldfield surrounding Dawson City, not a patch of free land remained. Every single claim had been staked. The prospectors already in Yukon when Skookum Jim and George Carmack found the gold were the ones who profited from the rush. All those thousands of people who'd come rushing up from America in 1897 were the ones who found themselves penniless and on the streets of Dawson City. So now you can probably see what we mean by a cruel punchline. It's estimated today that only 15,000 of the 40,000 who reached Dawson City managed to find gold. Of that 15,000, less than a third found enough to pay for their foolhardy adventure. Of that tiny fraction, an even tinier fraction managed to strike it rich. For most prospectors, the Klondike Gold Rush of 1897 was a brutal lesson in reality. But not everyone was heartbroken to be trapped in Dawson City. For some, their Yukon adventure, it was just the beginning. If you were to ask someone today to name the second biggest city on the western seaboard, there is a roughly 0% chance they would say Dawson City. But if you had asked that question in 1898, that's exactly the answer you'd have got. By the summer of that year, Dawson City held over 40,000 people. Now, that might not sound like a lot, but in 1898, it was second only to San Francisco on the Pacific coast. At the very least, it was equal with Seattle. And that meant there were plenty of opportunities for those with a good nose for them. People like Kathleen Rockwell, aka Klondike Kate. Rockwell was a dancer whose troupe came to Dawson City for a few nights, but while there, she made an excellent observation. Almost all of those who rushed to Klondike were male. And there's nothing a lonely man far from home wants to do more than spend a few minutes with a woman. If you're assuming Klondike Kate became a lady of the night, you should pick your head out of the gutter. She was a dancer, and she got a gig dancing fully clothed in Dawson City. But, and this was the key, she was extremely adept at talking to men. So adept that men began coming to her as much for the between dance chats as her famous pink tights. Before long, Kate was able to charge a nugget of gold for just talking to a miner in the street. In the one year she was in Dawson City, she made $30,000. That money back then was enough to set Kate up for life. Not that Kate was the only one to find fortune away from the gold fields. Joseph Ledoux was the guy who officially founded Dawson City a couple of months after Skookum Joe and George Carmack first struck gold. His first move? Build a sawmill. While that might sound a bit odd, it made him very wealthy. When the first waves of prospectors showed up looking for lumber to build their homes, Joe Ledoux was the guy selling it to them. We can only assume at this point that Joe Ledoux said ka-ching. But then that was Dawson City, a place where you could live a life of champagne as easily as you could starve to death in the bitter cold. And just like any boomtown, Dawson City couldn't last. In fall 1898, two Swedes and a Norwegian stumbled across some gold deposits at Anvil Creek, Alaska. It wasn't a ton of gold, but it was still enough that some of the prospectors stuck in Dawson City decided to hell with Klondike and went to try their luck. They arrived too late to stake their claims again and were forced to set up camp not by the riverbed but on a nearby beach. And it was here that they made their amazing discovery. The beach at Nome was full of gold. It was just lying there, ready to be sifted out of the sands, and because you couldn't stake claims on a beach, that meant anyone with a bag of equipment could set up and just start looking for their fortunes. When word reached Dawson City, it killed the town even faster than it had been born. In a single week, 8,000 residents left the Nome. By the time the 20th century dawned, Dawson City was a near ghost town. Its fancy hotels all but abandoned, and only a couple of diehards were left, wondering what the heck had happened. What had happened was the last great adventure had finally ended. Today, Dawson City is home to a mere 1,410 souls, less than 0.1% of the population of Seattle. It's still a gold mining town, and some of the mines are still family affairs. Small plots that dedicated people work, bringing in just enough to sustain their lives in the Canadian wilderness. Skagway, too, is just a shadow of its former self, a colorful little town of about 900 that Soapy Smith wouldn't even recognize. But the overall legacy of the Klondike Gold Rush is a far less settled affair. On the plus side, the rush produced so much gold that it's said to have helped rebalance the American economy. On the downside, that tide of humanity sweeping into a formerly pristine wilderness did environmental damage that hasn't been undone even now, over a century later. It proved disastrous too for First Nations peoples who saw their traditional hunting grounds destroyed by strangers driven mad by gold fever. In the end, perhaps the most remarkable thing about Klondike is that it happened at all.
It says something about the desperation of daily life in the late 19th century that a hundred thousand people would be willing to abandon everything they had, everything they held dear, to just leave their jobs, their families, their homes, and travel to an inhospitable wilderness in the faint hope of finding gold. That they did was somewhere between brave and foolhardy, between admirable and stupid. But stupid or not, there's no doubting that their arrival changed this corner of Canada forever. The Klondike Gold Rush may have been the 19th century's last great adventure, but its effects are still being felt even today. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below and don't forget to subscribe. Also, why not check out our sister channel, Biographics. This is a channel all about geography. That is a channel all about people. It is linked to below. And as always, thank you for watching.